It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah, baby. Woohoo! It's Monday. Hello, everybody. Thank you, fake audience. Thank you, uh, Keith Lou Brandt's intro. Let's say hello to the folks in the chat room really quick because I've got a lot of stuff to cover today. Um, so I'm not going to go down the list of everybody that's in the chat room today, although it looks like the gang is all here, plus a lot of new, well, I was going to say gang members, but I don't mean it to sound like that, just sounded. Hello, everybody. Um, hope you guys had a nice Thanksgiving if you live in the U.S. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I am already sick of turkey leftovers. I, I'm not exaggerating to say that we've had turkey for every meal since Thursday night, um, lunches and dinners. No turkey breakfast, uh, although I guess we could have made turkey sausage. A uh, little burnt out on the turkey, so tonight we're having fish for dinner. And today we're going to talk about tips for creating instrumental cues. Yeah, woohoo! <laughs> Uh, the audience went crazy for that one. Um, so if you're a regular Taxi TV watcher, much of what you're going to hear today has been talked about on other shows over many years. But today's episode is a consolidation of that information. Uh, so it's all in one place. Um, if you're a new member uh, to Taxi or new to watching Taxi TV, this episode could be a life changer for you. Um, every day. There are thousands of musicians working from home studios all over the world, and they're making money composing and producing instrumentals and instrumental cues that mostly get used in TV shows. Um, instrumentals also get used in film, corporate videos, music on hold, in-store music, video games, YouTube videos, and other forms of media I probably forgot uh, when I was typing out that list. For the purpose of today's show, though, most of what I'm talking about is creating instrumentals and instrumental cues for television. Some instrumental composers make a few hundred dollars a year. Well, actually, some make nothing, but that's a, another <laughs> issue. Maybe they're just early in the game, or maybe they haven't figured out what the secret sauce is yet. But there are plenty of instrumental composers that are making a little supplemental income of a few hundred bucks a year. Some make thousands a year, some make tens of thousands of dollars a year, and some make really nice six-figure incomes year after year. Those composers will likely retire with a significant nest egg if they do it for enough years. Um, I don't know how many of you have chased uh, the rock star dream or even accomplished it. Uh, no, actually, I'm reading my words incorrectly. I don't know how many people... I don't know many people who have chased the rock star dream or even accomplished it who retired comfortably. It's sad to think how many people, you know, wanted to be a rock star and here they are decades later um, still chasing the dream but having not accomplished that goal. It's a little bit heartbreaking because in the end, yeah, maybe they want to fly around in private jets, maybe they want the fame, maybe they want the fortune, but I think for a lot of people they would just like to make uh, a nice income from making music because that's what they love to do and, and they should be able to earn an income doing that. Um, other people, uh, you know, just figured out that that wasn't realistic and at some point they went, oh, I can make instrumental music and uh, earn a nice living from that. And we have many, 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 I mean, literally thousands of members over the years that have figured that out and gone on to do that. Other people just fell in love with the idea of creating instrumental cues right off the bat, and that's what they jumped into. Um, so are, are the people that are making money creating instrumentals better musicians or better composers than you? No, they're probably not. They just took an honest look at where they were with their dream of making music that they could get paid for, and then they taught themselves to see what type of music was actually needed, and they learned how to create it. I'm going to repeat that. They taught themselves to see what type of music was actually needed, and they learned to create it. Remember that. That's really important. So, in a sense, they designed their own future by learning how to create music that would be valuable to somebody, rather than complaining about how the industry and their elusive fan base didn't value the music they are making. 
I want to repeat that too. In a sense, they designed their own future by learning how to create music that would be valuable to somebody rather than complaining about how the industry and their elusive fan base didn't value their music. We've all seen that show, right? So, what is a composer? Is it somebody with crazy hair that sits around with a pile of staff paper, penciling in notes and wadding up paper and throwing it in the garbage and starting all over? Probably not. It's a composer, and I think a lot of people see the word composer and they go, oh, I'm not a composer. You know, I don't look like Beethoven or Chopin. Um, really what it is, uh, or I should say, is it somebody who wants to compete with Hans Zimmer and score Hollywood blockbusters? Well, it could be, but that person isn't what we're really talking about in this week's episode. In this context, a composer is mostly, most likely a songwriter or artist who saw the light, took existing playing, engineering, and producing skills, and then use them in a new and different way. I'm gonna repeat that. They're likely a songwriter or artist who saw the light and took existing playing, engineering, and producing skills and used them in a new and different way. So in my humble opinion, being a composer in this context is easier than being a songwriter or an artist. I actually think it's quite a bit easier. You don't need to write lyrics. You don't need to sing vocals. You don't need background vocals. And the mixes are often much easier because you don't have the vocals or background vocals and you also have less tracks to worry about in the mix. So it's easier and it goes faster. So let me ask you a question. Could you, the people watching this show right now, uh, could you have created that opening theme I just played? I'm going to play it for you again. So there you go. That's actually kind of an abbreviated cue. Technically, that's called a bumper. Um, a taxi member, very talented taxi member, who's become a good friend of mine over the years, named Keith LeBrant, created that for me um, for the recent convention we did, the Taxi Road Rally, or as we said this year, the Virtual Road Rally. Um, Keith started out as a songwriter. He, uh, I actually, I should say, he was a gigging musician that, that played a lot. Um, played out a lot. So was he also, or is he still a songwriter? Yeah, he is. Um, Does Keith LeBrant have wild hair? Well, maybe. (laughs) I'm kidding, Keith, if you're watching. Um, A ruffled collar and stacks of staff paper, like that vision of what a composer is supposed to be that lives inside of the minds of so many people? No, he's just a regular old musician like you guys. Um... He's got a home studio, you know, uh, and he certainly has great guitar chops. Uh, And that piece of music was created for me for the road rally. And I just told him, um, create something that sounds like ZZ Top or Joe Walsh. That's kind of uh, riff based guitar. And he did. I think that one is a 15 second version of it. Um, He also did like a, a a four second, I think, and a 10 second, and a 20 second, and a 30 second, and maybe even like a, a minute or a two minute version of it. All these different cut downs and alt mixes of, of what I thought I might need for uh, the road rally. Um, did Keith figure out that he could earn a really nice supplemental income and the tens of thousands of dollars a year on top of his day gig as a computer programmer and web developer by creating instrumental cues for TV and commercials? Hell yeah, he did. So let's get started by explaining what an instrumental is and what an instrumental cue is. So uh, they're often confused, and a lot of people who like don't know the drill yet think that they're the same thing, but they're really not. Um, an instrumental is actually more like a song. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example. A good example here, an instrumental might be like a cocktail solo piano jazz piece that you hear playing in a restaurant. I know you guys who are regular watchers go, can't you come up with a better example or a different example? But I can't. That That's maybe the most frequently, uh, 
Well, it's certainly the one that pops in my head most frequently. So an instrumental is just more like a song, but without vocals. Um, an example of where that cocktail jazz piece might be used and, and why it's longer, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, imagine a restaurant scene. Imagine a husband and wife in a movie or a TV show that go out for dinner and they're eating at a swanky restaurant and that music is getting used in the background. It's actually called a background source cue because, or background source um, instrumental in this case, because it's ostensibly coming from a source. Um, in the restaurant setting, it might be a, a piano player off in the corner of the restaurant, 30 or 50 feet away and just playing, you know, light cocktail jazz. It could be coming out of the restaurant's PA system, out of those eight inch white round flat speaker things up in the ceiling. Um, but it's an instrumental because it's number one, it's longer. It's probably somewhere in the two to four minute range. Um, why would it be longer? Why would being longer be a good thing? because chances are that couple sitting at the table enjoying their swanky dinner at a fancy restaurant is probably having a conversation that's going to last more than eight seconds or 15 seconds or 32 seconds. It's probably a whole conversation. So they need a piece of music that feels like it would be played in that room, either by a, a piano player off in the distance or coming out of speakers or wherever. So it's more like a song. It's probably got an intro, a verse, a chorus, um, a bridge, another chorus, or another verse, another chorus. Um, you add that all up and it's two minutes, three minutes, maybe even four minutes long, but typically more like two to three minutes long. Now, a cue has a different purpose in life. A cue, oh, let me go back because people always ask this question. Um, an instrumental is like a song without a vocal. It's like hitting the mute button on the vocal track, right? Except that if you do that, now you've taken out the melody that the vocal did. And frankly, it'll sound a lot like a rhythm track. So you need to put some melody back in there. I personally have come up with the term, I think I coined this term maybe 10 years ago, uh, melody light. Um, sounds like somebody's name. Hello, have you seen Melody Light? <laughs> Anyway, um, melody light would be just playing parts of the melody, hints of melody, maybe just the first note of every bar. Um, something that represents the melody so it doesn't just sound like chord changes over, well, in that case, it'd just be chord changes on, on a piano. Uh, but let's say that it was kind of a full band instrumental. Um, if you took out the vocal and it didn't have a melody, it would then sound like a rhythm track where you just muted the vocal track and it sounds unnatural and unfinished. Um, so if you just take the lead instrument and add a little bit of melody back in, it feels more natural and it feels like it's going somewhere. And going somewhere is important, um, both for instrumentals and instrumental cues. It needs to, you don't want to notice the music if you're the director of that TV show or that movie, you don't want the people in the audience sitting in the theater or sitting at home on their couch watching TV to think, wow, that's great music. Generally, you want them watching you know, the actors and listening to the dialogue and going wherever the script is going. The music is there to create a mood. It's there to enhance an emotion, whether that's happy or sad or quizzical or mysterious, or dangerous, and we'll get into emotions in a little bit. Um, gee, I hope I made a note about that. Um, but so that's what an instrumental does. Now an instrumental cue is generally minimally 60 seconds-ish long, and I say ish because yeah, could it be 57 seconds? Yeah, you're pushing your luck a little bit there, but yeah, it could be a little bit less than 60 seconds. Most of the production music libraries, which are the publishers that sign this stuff and then get it out to the TV shows and movies, um, generally they want stuff that's minimally 60 seconds, 90 seconds makes them happier. And an instrumental cue does not typically have um, a long intro. It probably has a super short intro, like really short. Oftentimes it has no intro at all. 
Um, it might just, as a matter of fact, I'm going to play Keith LeBrant's thing one more time and listen to how this opens with the drum fill. See that? A drum fill. That sets it up. That pulls you into it. It announces it's here, but it gets you right into the red meat. It gets you into typically an instrumental cue is mostly an A section. And my personal opinion, I think others might agree with me, is the A section is probably more like the chorus of a song, less like the verse. Now you might think, well, geez, 90 seconds of just that A section over and over and over again might get tedious and boring and just flatline, you know? Um, that's true. There are some cues, which hopefully I'll remember to talk about later, where that might, where you want them to not have a sense of forward movement or momentum. A, a drone cue, uh, like that? <laughs> Who needs a synthesizer, right? Uh, a drone cue may not want to move forward, may not want that forward momentum. Maybe you just want that drone cue there to create some sweaty palms or... You know, it's almost just like the sound of air, air conditioning. I talked about this uh, recently in another episode of Taxi TV. Virtually every scene you see where there's dialogue, if there's no music, there's nothing else going on, do you know that editors actually put in what's called room tone, which could be like right now, I can hear my refrigerator running. It's, I don't know, 12 to 15 feet away. That's part of the room tone. If the heater or air conditioner were on, that would be part of the room tone. If you were watching a scene that had two people, you know, one person searching for another in racks of servers at a big server farm, you would hear the whirring of the fans on, on the servers. So there's got to be something in there. So that's what drone cues do is they're kind of like room tone in that they fill up space because if it's just dead air, you would feel that and it wouldn't be a good thing. But a drone cue also adds maybe mystery or suspense or danger. That's a whole other thing. I don't want to do a whole show on drone cues today. But typically, cues, and now I'm not working from paper, but I probably should be because I took the time to write all this stuff out. Um, most cues, leaving drone cues on, on the side of the table for the moment, Editors are looking for music that moves a scene forward and adds an emotion or underscores a mood or maybe even creates a mood. Maybe it's a scene where there's little to no dialogue and the music actually does really go a long way in setting that mood. So you need it to a typical TV cue. And um, I made a note here about orchestral versus swampy. Uh, orchestral versus swampy blues versus dramedy. Okay, so orchestral. We all know what orchestral sounds like, right? Um, think of orchestral as, you know, a, a medium to large size orchestra. Of course, it could be smaller. And the music in a cue form would typically build. It would come in with a short intro, probably not... <laughs> Probably not a drum fill like that, um, but it could be a couple of timpani hits. Uh, it could be a few notes on a violin that leads you in. It, it could be a one-bar intro, a two-bar intro. It could be a two-note intro, something that says, boom, here I am, right? The cue has started. And then you go into this A section. But how do you keep the A section from becoming boring and, and repetitive and flatlining? You start out a little bit skinny, and then a couple bars later, maybe two bars, maybe four bars. It, it all depends on the piece, the tempo. Oh, there are many factors that go into deciding how long it is before you add other instrumentation. So it is still that A section in repeat mode, but now you've added, let's say the cue starts out, your orchestral cue starts out with um, piano and cello. Um, or the cello section. And then a couple bars into it, you would add the violas. So there's a change. It's subtle, 
but there's something about it that changes, so it feels like it's moving forward. And then two bars or four bars later, you would add the violins to it. Uh, maybe another couple bars later, you would add some brass or woodwinds to it. So you're doing that as it moves along. <laughs> there I am doing my bunny rabbit imitation. Um, but you stack things up. It's moving forward, getting bigger, getting bigger. Um, and then you're out of screen, so you don't know what the hell I'm doing <laughs> over there. But it's, uh, it's always moving forward until it may get, it doesn't have to get, but many times, and it's not a hard, fast rule, but it may have a B section. That, in my personal opinion, oftentimes that B section is kind of like what a bridge would do in a typical song. It's kind of a variation on the theme. Maybe it's uh, reversing the chords. Maybe it's changing the voicing on the chords. Um, but that's a, a short section. Usually, you know, it's going to be like two bars or four bars or eight bars in the middle. Uh, and the reason that you put that in there is you may need some sort of change. Or it may be that the editor who's looking for a music for a scene goes, you know, I like what it's doing in that B section. So I'm going to start out on the last two bars, on the downbeat of the last two bars of that B section, and then let it roll right back into the A section. Now, an editor working, and let's talk about reality shows, because that's probably where, like, I don't know, 70, 80, 90% of instrumental cues get used. On, a, on an hour-long drama, it's probably mostly scored. So could there be cues that they add later because they didn't score a scene and later decided they need score, but now the composer can't turn it around fast enough, or it's something that wouldn't normally be part of the score of the show. So they, I'm trying to think, uh, let's say the score, you're working on a murder mystery, but let's say that it takes place at Christmas time. And somebody, the two characters are having a conversation. They're walking down a street in front of a department store. Um, who are those wonderful people with the little red kettle that uh, collect money every year for, at Christmas time? So that person is out there ringing their bell and the, their little kettle collecting uh, donations. Um, maybe for that moment, maybe as you walk by or they, the characters walk by the store, Maybe somebody opens the door of the department store and you hear instrumental music that would be holiday instrumental music, like Jingle Bells, an instrumental version of Jingle Bells, that come up for just a couple of seconds as the door opens up as the characters are passing by, right? So there you go. Um, I see Scott Hansen's in the house and crack. It's Salvation Army, thank you. Um, Scott Hansen cracking jokes. I can't break my rhythm, Scott, so I'm not going to read or laugh at your jokes today, but I'm sure they're really good. Um, okay, so if they're working on a reality TV show, they need music and practically all the music that you're going to hear in most reality TV shows. Of course, there are exceptions to every rule in the world, but the editors look for music that is appropriate for the scene. Do they want it to be funnier? So maybe they use comedic music. Do Maybe it's somebody sneaking around the house trying to hide a present that they're going to wrap for Christmas later. What would you hear for that? Probably dramedy music. You know, that pizzicato string stuff. Do, 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 do. So it's going to be a little mischievous sounding, a little funny sounding, and dramedy oftentimes, I would say, the majority of the dramedy music you hear is kind of based in that um, pizzicato string style. Of course, you could do, you know, rather than tink, tink, tink on a violin, you could do it on a marimba. You could do it maybe on a guitar, maybe on a kalimba. Use your imagination. But the style of it is probably going to be pretty close to that pizzicato music um, what was the TV show with the ladies always sneaking around looking in windows? Um, can never remember the name of that show. I'm sure somebody in the chat room will mention it. Um, uh, Desperate Housewives. Beat you to the, the punch today. Um, so Desperate Housewives, I think, was probably the show that 
popularized dramedy um, with the ladies, you know, jumping over the little white picket fence, looking in somebody's window to see if they're having an affair with another neighbor's husband. They're sneaking around, so you would hear that mis mischievous or mischievous, depending on where you're from, um, sneaky, comedic, dramedy music. But is the whole piece going to play? Probably not. How long is that scene going to be? It might only be four seconds. It might edit from that lady who's going to be sneaky walking out the front door of her house, and that might just be like a, a cello, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, it's telegraphing. There's a little bit of danger in the wind. And then once the, the lady jumps over the fence and sticks her head and looks in the window, that's when you would get that comedic or mischievous dramedy music. And that might only be for a few seconds as she looks in the window. And then one of the characters on the inside of the house happens to glance over at the window. She backs off and runs away and goes back to her house. That might be a whole different instrumental cue. So the point is that editors piece together pieces of these cues according to the storyline, according to the emotion, and according to the mood that they're looking for. So it's very, very rare that an instrumental cue which is mostly A section, possibly with a B section, it's rare that the whole thing would get used from top to bottom. However, should you compose it as one, one motif all the way through? Yes, and here's why. Because you don't know how long that editor is going to use it for. So let's say that they end up using it for 39 seconds. Well, you can't compose it like a score to a movie where you're scoring the picture because the score ostensibly would change with the action or the mood or the storyline, right? So you could guess and just make up a storyline or the action in your head and score all these different pieces and different moods, maybe even different tempos. But what are the odds that if they need to use a longer piece that that's going to line up with the show they're working on or with the scene? Practically never. I mean, that's almost a zilch. So you need to create a cue that's, let's say, 90 seconds long-ish. Could be 87, could be, you know, um, a minute and 45 seconds. Uh, you know, it doesn't have to be exactly 60 seconds or 90 seconds. So it's got to be one thing all the way through in case they need to use a longer piece of it. Now, let's say that your buildup of tracks and your forward momentum that you've built doesn't really match what's going on in the scene. Well, the editor is going to take bits and pieces, kind of like Legos, and move those around to suit the action in, or the mood in the scene. So that's why it needs to be just one thing. Remember City Slickers? Um, where Billy Crystal is talking to, I can't remember the actor's name, but, you know, the old guy, old, uh, you know, kind of leather-faced cowboy, and he's leaning up against the rock. Uh, I think he's dying, and Billy Crystal says, what's the secret to life? And, and he goes, holds up his finger, and he says, it's just one thing. Um, I've always personally taken that to mean, I, I see everything in terms of music, apparently. Jack Palance, thank you, guys. Um, it's just one thing. Well, yeah, if you try to make it too many things, then it can't be used. But if it's just one thing, that is the secret to life in getting your cues used more often because there will be many more applications for that piece of music because it's just one thing. Might they need to move the, the Lego blocks around and reorder it according to kind of the emotional tempo and the physical tempo of the scene to make it work better? Yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to play you the Keith LeBrant opening again in a second, but we had an incredibly talented video editor, uh, Laurel Ostrander at the Road Rally in 2019, I believe, and in 2018. She was so good in 2018 that the members asked me to bring her back again uh, to do her thing again in 2019, and we did. She was amazing. She actually took scenes of a reality TV show, 
uh, and took uh, some tracks from a production music library that granted us kind of a, a free license to use it at the road rally. And she would sit there and say, okay, so now for, she called it a beat. A beat is like a moment, um, a thing within a scene. The whole scene might be somebody driving to the grocery store. A beat might be the moment that you see the interior of the car with the two actors talking. Another beat within the scene would be an exterior shot of the road ahead. Um, another beat might be them pulling into the parking lot. So for each of those beats within the scene, she would say, okay, so what do I need here? Um, she could have used the same, you know, kind of traveling music um, that had a nice tempo and made you feel like you were going somewhere. She could have used that same thing all the way through, but let's say that she needed to vary it for whatever reason. Maybe the conversation in the car was kind of heavy. Um, maybe there was a traffic accident up ahead. So she would need to bring things in and out that lined up emotionally and action wise within that with those beats within the scene so she said one of the things that i look for when i find when i'm searching through cues and what they do is they look at a very long list of cues that are all online or at least online to their computer maybe from an internal server could be a server in the cloud but they're looking at a list of cues now, is she thinking, I'm going to need um, a classical piece here? Maybe not. Maybe they're not looking by genre, but maybe they're looking by emotion. So, but maybe she feels like that piece of music, um, when they first cut to the interior shot of the car, they need something to say, here I am, and introduce the cue, and that could be... So that's one of the things that she said that she looks for is anything that walks you into the intro or the beginning of the cue. Um, now imagine if the Keith LeBrant thing had like a 30 second intro, like a song might have, even a 10 or 15 second intro. Um, if you're the editor, do you want to audition 75 tracks? Because they may listen to five, they may listen to 75, they may listen to 105 just to find that piece of music for that first beat within the scene. So if every one of those pieces of music had an intro that's really not like the red meat of the rest of the cue, that's a big time suck, right? Time waster. So they actually prefer something that gets right to the heart of the matter and probably has a little thing that walks you into it, goes, here I am. So that was very educational for all of us, myself included. I had never had that thought before, that just having a little drum turnaround, or it could be a guitar riff, bam, 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 um, no drum turn, just bam, 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 just that lick is enough of an intro to introduce the music into that scene. Um, so let's talk about how different genres require different approaches. Earlier I mentioned um, orchestral versus swampy blues versus dramedy. Now, each of those types of music is obviously different. So for an orchestral piece, um, it may not need I don't think of a big orchestral piece like you might hear in a film trailer, a movie trailer, because um, that's a whole other thing unto itself. It's related. It's a first cousin, but it's not in the nuclear family, okay? But uh, so let's say you're creating an orchestral cue for something. That might not have as much movement or as much action or as much growth as a dramedy cue might. Um, or it might have less than a swampy blues cue. So each of them, according to the genre and what the possible purposes or ways in which those types of cues will be used, once you gain some experience, you'll start to understand, oh, so if I'm doing an orchestral cue, 
Um, you know, should I make it big and bombastic like Pirates of the Caribbean? And if I do so, that might have bigger changes in it and more forward movement. Um, but what if it's um, an orchestral cue for somebody who is having a reflective moment? Um, my wife and I just watched, uh, we binged uh, over a period of about 10 days, the TV series Poldark on Amazon Prime. And it takes place in the, let's see, late 1700s, I believe, like 1780-something. Um, so if there's a scene where somebody just comes back from, you know, fighting the Revolutionary War in America, now they've returned home to England, and that soldier is sitting in his room, he's come home, he's hugged his family, it's so good to be home, and now he's back in his bedroom, and he's taking off his army boots, and he's taking off his uniform, and he lays his gorgeous sword on the bed, and he's reflecting about friends that he lost during the many battles he was in during the Revolutionary War in America. Um, that's not going to be the same kind of orchestral piece as what you might hear in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, which is bigger, more action-oriented, more bombastic. So for that type of piece, there probably wouldn't be a lot of buildup. There would be some. But it might be as simple as just, you know, starting out with cello and then adding a solo violin, just playing a very simple um, kind of legato melody over the cellos, then maybe introducing a little light piano work. But it's not going to be build it, build it, build it. It's not going to be that. So a swampy blues cue. Um, let's say that's being used in a show like, oh gosh, uh, Swamp People. Um, and they're going out to hunt alligators in the swamps of Louisiana that morning. And um, so they are, they're starting out, they're waking up, they're walking out of the house, they're getting in their vehicle, as the vehicle starts to go down the road, if that cue is playing, it's going to build more. It's going to move forward more. And then they arrive at their destination where they're going to go catch the alligator or shoot the raccoon or whatever they do in Swamp People. When they arrive, they need an exclamation point. And that's the other end of what an instrumental cue does. Excuse me. And that's what editors look for. Does it have a good beginning? Does it have a middle that moves it forward appropriately for the type of scene that I'm looking for or the beat within the scene? And then does it have a stinger ending? And a stinger ending is, listen to, I think Keith's got one on this, he does. <laughs> that is a stinger ending. It, could, it didn't necessarily need... Ding, 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 ding. It could have just been bomp, but it says, we're at the end, exclamation point, there you go. Um, so that's you know kind of what a, a swampy blues cue uh, might need. And a dramedy cue would be a whole other thing. So you really have to think about the type, the genre... Um, the application, and it's always good as you're working on these things, think about usability. Who needs this? What could they use it for? That will help you create better cues that will make you more money. Um, that really is the secret to, <laughs> the secret to life, as Jack Pallant said, is just one thing. Well, uh, maybe the most important thing in creating instrumental cues is how and when and for what can this piece of music be used? If you keep that in your mind as you're composing it versus just, oh, the muse hit me this morning. I think I'll create something light and dreamy. Well, where could that light and dreamy thing be used? You know, maybe nowhere because of the way you constructed it. Um, so always keep that stuff in the back of your mind. Obviously, you don't know exactly which type of scene or what kind of beat it's going to be used in the future because you're human and you can't predict the future. But if you have kind of a, a ballpark, a range of types of scenes, going back to the swampy blues cue, 
where is that going to be used most of the time? You can kind of see the scenes in your head and compose accordingly. Now, within Swampy Blues, um, you could have Sad Swampy Blues, you could have Happy Swampy Blues, you could have Action-Oriented Swampy Blues, uh, you could have Mysterious Swampy Blues. There are all kinds of emotions that you can build into that genre. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So the bottom line is, for instrumental cues, very short intro, could be a drum fill, could be a guitar lick, could be a few little notes on piano. Boom, you're into it, you're into the A section, you're building up, you're building up, then you drop back down, you go into the B section, which is just kind of a, a change that gives the editor another option, um, but it keeps you within that motif and within that same emotion. Um, and then you come out of it and you probably go back to a skinny version of the A section again and then you build it up, build it up, build it up, and then boom, you hit them with the crescendo that takes you to the stinger ending, which is the exclamation point. Sometimes they might just use the stinger all by itself. Sometimes it could, they might just use this. Might just be that. They don't need your whole cue they rarely use a whole cue, as I said before. Okay. Um, wow, I've covered a lot of what I had written down. I did it all with my own brain. Okay, popular genres. Stick with me through this. Um, first of all, if you don't have this book, and I don't make a penny from recommending this, Writing Production Music for TV by Steve Barden. The Road to Success. Writing Production Music for TV, The Road to Success by Steve Barden. Steve is a very longtime taxi member who is super talented, super, um, super capable. He's just really, really good at what he does. And he wrote this book probably, I'm guessing, three years ago-ish. Um, many, many, many taxi members have it. If you want to do instrumental cues, you have to have this book. Um, I'm looking to see if there's a price on here anywhere. Um, $29.99, and I guarantee you that it'll be the best 30 bucks you've spent in a very long time. If you want to do instrumental music for television and some film, you need to have this book. If you don't have the book, You've just saved 30 bucks and cost yourself a career. It's that good. So within the book, he's, and again, I don't make a penny from recommending that. Uh, and I'm not doing it because Steve's my friend. He's my friend because he wrote a good book and he's a really talented guy. So hang in there with me for this. This is the long, not boring, actually it might be the most enlightening part um, of today's show he's got pages you know if you just bought the book for appendix a and appendix b in this book honestly if it were a hundred dollars and all you got it for were these two appendices um that was my big word for the day you would have spent your money really well so under music genres in appendix a um he's got primary genres um alternative anime, um, blues, children's music, classical, comedy, country, dance, um, also known as EDM or electronic dance music, easy listening, electronic, fitness and workout, folk, hip hop and rap, holiday, indie pop, industrial, inspirational, um, Christian and gospel. By the way, Liz, if you could, could you go track down the, the URL for this on Amazon and throw it in the chat room so people can find it easily? Um, where the heck was I? Um, inspirational, Christian and gospel. Um, jazz, Latin, marching band, new age, opera, pop, R&B, um, already done. Wow, good, wow, good job, Liz. You're on your game today. Not that you're not on your game other days, but you got that up there very quickly. Good job. Thank you. 
um, opera, pop, which obviously is really broad, R&B, soul, reggae, rock, another broad one, singer-songwriter, uh, Tex-Mex, Tejano, vocal, um, and world. Okay, so those are primary genres. Now, um, just under alternative, remember the first one on, on the list was alternative, Subgenres under alternative. I'm not going to do this for every genre because we'd be here for a month. Um, Subgenres under alternative are art punk. Didn't even know that one existed. Alternative rock, college rock, crossover thrash, crust punk. Didn't know that one existed. Experimental rock, folk punk, goth or gothic rock, grunge, hardcore punk, hard rock, indie rock, lo-fi rock, New Wave, Progressive Rock or Prog Rock, Punk, Shoegaze, and Steampunk. And those are just subgenres that he's got underneath Alternative. Um, let me skip around here. So you're thinking classical music. Oh, I can hear classical music in my head. Probably created by some dude with crazy hair and a ruffly collar and stacks of staff paper that have been wadded up and thrown in the trash. Well, maybe, but it's not just one thing, because subgenres under classical would be avant-garde, baroque, chamber music, chant, um, classical crossover, contemporary classical, early music, expressionist, high classical, um, impressionist, medieval, uh, minimalism, modern composition, opera, orchestral, renaissance, romantic, uh, and wedding music. Those would be under, those are subgenres under classical. Um, let me see. Um, under rock, acid rock, adult oriented rock, um, Afro punk, adult alternative, alternative rock, American traditional rock, um, Anatolian rock, uh, arena rock, art rock, blues rock, British invasion, cock rock. Death metal, black metal, doom metal, glam rock, gothic metal, grindcore, hair metal, hard rock, um, math metal, math rock, metal, metalcore, noise rock, jam bands. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Um, now you're, uh, so that gives you just some example of all the possibilities that you have. Singer, songwriter. Um, if there was... On a list of things I wish I could change for taxi members, it would be that our middle-aged to older members seem to think that singer-songwriter means Carol King, James Taylor, um, maybe Billy Joel, you know, people of that era. But now singer-songwriter has changed a lot. But just under singer-songwriter, some of the possibilities are alternative folk, contemporary folk, Contemporary singer-songwriter, indie folk, folk rock, love song, new acoustic, and traditional folk. And that's just under singer-songwriter. Um, world music is incredibly long. I'm not even going to read those off. But you get the idea. There are all these different subgenres. So if you see a taxi listing that asks for classical, don't just stop at the first sentence or the first paragraph of the listing. Go, oh, I can do classical read further and then go listen to the examples of the references because those are hints those are a map to what they're looking for yeah they want classical but what kind of classical um, and don't give them something if they don't specify or if the references don't point in that direction don't give them some weird like you know hardly ever heard form of classical because that's going to limit your possibilities as, as to its uses. Um, always default to the most common denominator. What's the most common form of classical that would be used? Um, okay, so that is that. So popular genres um, are often dictated. The most people always want to know, where should I start? What are the most used genres? Well, the rule of thumb for where you should start, especially if you come from, I'm a singer-songwriter, or I'm in a band, or I'm a performing artist, what is the genre of music that you've been doing most of your life? What is the genre of music that you are most adept at doing? 
the most comfortable doing, start there because you want to build the skill set. You want to learn the rules of the road um, and you want to learn the ropes because <laughs> I can't make everything about cars. Um, you want to learn these things by starting out doing what you're comfortable with because that will get you a result more quickly. Um, so if you're somebody that normally does strummy acoustic guitar singer songwriter stuff, why would you start out doing big bombastic, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean orchestral pieces? That's going to be, you're biting off a lot more than you should probably want to chew or digest by doing that. So start out with light strummy acoustic stuff because number one, you have the acoustic guitar skills. Number two, you probably already have the, the skills to record an acoustic guitar well and produce acoustic tracks well. And start out simply. It might just be a two-track thing. They are usually, rarely are they looking for the world's best composer. I'm going to repeat that. Rarely are they looking for somebody who is the world's best composer. An editor working on a reality show is not thinking, oh, I'm looking for a spectacularly, spectacularly good composer. No, they're looking for a composer that's created a piece that best fits the scene, a piece that's the most usable. There's that word again, right? So you've already got chops writing, playing, recording, and producing acoustic guitar music. Start there. Start by creating cues in that genre. Even though it might not be the most often used genre, you're going to find your feet and build your skills by doing what comes naturally and comfortable to you, okay? So do that, and once you become very good at that, then move up to maybe acoustic pop rock because you're, you're building on that bass. Uh, and then after that, maybe you next tackle electric guitar pop rock. Um, so you're constantly building on a foundation of what you're comfortable with and what you're good at. And then at some point, um, you'll be able to branch out into other genres. Maybe you've gone from, you know, light acoustic, very simple one or two track cues to light acoustic um, pop rock, which would be, you know, a bass, drums, probably a couple of acoustic guitars maybe even a piano thrown in there or some sort of keyboard. Um, and, and then you move on to electric pop rock. Um, then maybe you move on to electric rock rock, just straight up, you know, kind of classic rock stuff. And then you go, well, I've come to learn, and this is a true statement, that hip hop is one of the most frequently requested genres. I want to learn how to do hip hop, but I've never done hip hop before you're probably going to make a lot of mistakes in the beginning, but you know what? So what? You learn from your mistakes, right? The chances of you taking on a new genre and nailing it right from the get-go, not that good. So first of all, you'd be wise to, there, there's a university that stares you in your face every day of your life that gives out the information for free, and that university is, no, nope, not taxi, although we do a lot of it, but the best thing you can do is watch reality shows. They use a ton of hip hop. Um, maybe watch Catfish or um, I'm trying to, I'm terrible with titles, but you know, like, I don't know, don't they have like, uh, I don't know, Urban Housewives or something like that. Some show that is primarily African-American cast members living in that world, the, you know, a lot of hip hop music would be used because that's the music the characters would listen to. That's the music that the audience listens to. So it only makes sense that you should learn from those examples. So before you sit down and try and create a hip hop instrumental piece, why not watch two or three episodes of one of those shows that uses a lot of hip hop and make notes? What kind of bass sounds? What kind of drum sounds? How many instruments are typically in the tracks? 
Do they have a B section in the cues? Um, not that they're going to typically play you the whole cue to figure that out, but sometimes they, they'll play enough of it that you can see there's a B section. Um, what are the intros like? What are, are the, the stinger endings like? You can learn all that just by watching TV. Do it with a notepad uh, or an iPad, you know, whether it's a legal pad or an iPad on your knee. Do it and take notes, and you'll start to see common threads. And that's when you should go in the studio and go, okay, so the tempo range that most of those cues that I heard in TV shows for hip hop, the tempo range is X. So now um, I'm going to start out by, you know, setting my BPM at NBA Wives, Paul Croteau says. There you go. Any of the housewives show. That's what I was tr trying to think of, but uh, couldn't get it together. So look at the range of tempos. They're going to be fairly close, although there could be, um, you know, kind of slow, pensive hip hop. There could be party hip hop. So the tempos may range, but pick a tempo for the kind of hip hop you want to create. Then choose an emotion. Then go back and study hip hop that is that emotion. Let's say um, comedic hip hop. Okay. So go watch a couple of episodes and take notes about comedic hip hop and then sit down and try and create it and then play yours against theirs and see what you got right and see what you got wrong. Jot down some notes, go back in the studio, fix it, see if it stacks up or it doesn't. So that's the process. Um, now, let's move on to Appendix B, which is the other thing that makes this book worth a hundred bucks just by itself. Appendix B, moods slash feelings. Okay, um, I'm going to give you kind of the, the big categories and then go back and give you some examples underneath the big categories. So the big categories um, that Steve Barden has put in here are happy slash positive. That's certainly a big category. What about sad, bad, or negative? What about neutral? Where it could be either one or kind of in the middle and not really happy, not really sad. Um, so now let's go back and look at happy, positive. I'm going to go through these really quick. I'm, I don't think I'm going to make it past... Eh, maybe. I don't know. Um, under happy, positive, animated, beautiful, bold, blissful, brassy, bright, brilliant, bubbly, carefree, careful, caring, cartoony, cautious, celebratory, um, celestial, cheerful, classy, comical, uh, confident, cool, curious, cute, delicate, delighted, determined, easy, ecstatic, elated, elegant, enchanted, fearful, Feel good, festive, flirtatious, fiery, freewheeling, friendly, fun, funky, funny, gentle, glamorous, glorious, good, good hearted, gorgeous, graceful, grand, green. Hmm, I have to, <laughs> to figure that out. Um, groovy, gutsy, happy, heavenly, honest, hopeful, humorous, jolly, joyful, lighthearted, um, lifting, um, I would put uplifting. I don't know if he's got that in there or not. Yeah, he does have uplifting. Um, loving, magical, majestic, motivational, nice, noble, playful, pleasant, pleased, optimistic, orange. I got to figure out why he's got, uh, I've got to ask Steve about that, why he's got colors in here. Um, outgoing, positive, purposeful, sassy, shimmering, silly, slapstick, uh, soaring, sparkling, sublime, successful, summery, sweeping, Sweet, tender, terrific, thankful, thrilling, triumphant, up, uplifting, vigorous, vibrant, whimsical, willful, wondrous, yellow. He's got with no W on it. I'm confused. And zany, um, calling the editor. Or it could be yellow. I don't know. I think it needs a W. And zany. Anyway, um, so when you sit down and create a piece, Mood and emotion and the feelings are really, really, really important. Um, because if it doesn't have that, it, it makes it unusable. 
I've heard a lot of great music in my lifetime, really great music. We've all heard it on Taxi TV episodes where we've you know, been in the A&R hot seat and we've listened to pieces that members have submitted. Um, I did a show, I think about two years ago, called What Mood Is This? or What Emotion Is This? And there were some pieces that we listened to that were great and people had a really hard time identifying what the mood or the emotion was. Well, if we couldn't do it with you know, groupthink, how would an editor who's busting their butt to get um, a certain amount of scenes edited to meet a deadline, and they are just burning through this stuff, they, they don't have the time to sit there and listen to the whole cue and pondering, hmm, well, I guess it could be this mood. Or, you know, maybe in the right context, it could be that mood. No, they want to hear something, and they want to know literally in a matter of a couple of seconds if the mood is right. A couple of seconds. That's all they're going to give it before they move on to the next one because they've probably got somewhere between 10 and 100 cues in that genre and purportedly in that mood staring them in the face in that bucket of instrumental cues that they're working with. They don't have time to give your cue a lot of attention. They just don't. I know that hurts to think that they're not going to sit there and love it and appreciate it and really study it and go, wow, this person's an awesome composer. That's what you want them to do, but that's not what they actually do. So you always have to put yourself, this is a good tip, always put yourself in the shoes of the end user, which in the case of television music, reality TV music in particular, it's the editor who's making that decision. The, the showrunner um, will go back and watch the episode and give notes back to the editor going, that music in that scene was a little too happy. Can you tone it down, make it a little more subdued? It should be emotionally uplifting, but not like joyous. It's a little too joyous, back it off a little bit, and they'll go replace the cue according to that note that they've gotten. Um, okay. So that's that. I've talked about genres. I've talked about emotion and moods. I implore you to buy this book if you don't have it. Ask somebody to get it for you for Christmas. It makes a great stocking stuffer. All right. Um, as you're creating a piece, always ask yourself, what kind of scene would it be used in? I know that oftentimes when I do those shows about what mood or what emotion... Um, people will go off the reservation a little bit in the audience in the chat room and they'll say, well, that would be great for uh, some guy walking out of his front door after having a fight with his wife. Well, okay, that's a description of the scene. What's the emotion? Could be fear, could be anger. Think about the emotion because you are, yes, it's good to think about what kind of scene it could be used in, but also think broader, put yourself in the end user's shoes because the end user is not always looking for something that denotes somebody had a fight with his or her spouse and they're slamming the door, walking out, getting in the car and driving away. You need something that they can hear three, four, five, six, ten 10 seconds of and go, that's anger. That feels like anger. And once they hear that anger, then they're going to look at how does the intro come in like that? And how does it end on the end? Does it give me an in? Does it give me an out? And then they're going to look at, believe it or not, the waveform. Why would they look at the waveform? Now, if you're longtime taxi members that watch a lot of our shows, you already know the answer, so don't blurt it out. I want to make this a mystery for the new kids in the class, okay? The reason they look at the waveform is they will look to see if the waveform looks dynamic. Does it get bigger as it moves forward? And does it have edit points? Now, an edit point could just be a snare beat. It could be a kick drum beat. It could be a cymbal crash. Or it could be a rest. It could literally be ba da boom, and it comes back in someplace where they can get that electronic razor blade in there to move the Lego parts around and use what they need, where they need it, in the order they need it to fit the timing of that beat or that scene, 
fit the emotion of it. And, you know, um, let's say the, the anger emotion is growing. And let's say that part of your cue that connotes anger doesn't quite move into intense anger as quickly as they need it for the scene. Well, they may want to take out four bars of the first part of that A section. They may only want to use the A section that follows the B section in the middle because that has more instrumentation and the anger has grown. So they look at the waveform because that's kind of a, a signpost to say, oh, look at that, the waveform is bigger in the last 30 seconds of the cue. That's where I've got the red meat that I'm looking for combined with more instrumentation and more oomph. So they would literally use that visual cue of the waveform to go see if the music does what they need it to do. So waveforms are important. Um, titles. I love talking about titles. It's one of my favorite subjects. I want to read you some titles. I'm going to go to a web page. Um, one of our members, a guy named Derek Handy, um, I think is one of the best titlers of cues that I've ever seen. Um, whoops, I should probably close that. Okay, so Derek Handy is a taxi member from Montgomery, Alabama. Um, he's gotten a lot of placements and on his page, which you can go see after the show because you don't want to take your eyes off me, right? <laughs> Taxi.com slash members slash D Handy, H-A-N-D-Y, D Handy, short for Derek Handy, obviously. He's got 200 tracks on his taxi member um, profile. Um, Getting a dry throat. Hang on. Oops. Nothing like a little Red Bull splashed up your nose. Um, I'm going to read you some of these titles uh, out of the 200 that are on this page. First one, Belly Dance Trap. It's trap music with a belly dance melody and some belly dance. Um, I I'd play it for you. But some of this stuff may be in libraries. I don't want to get into any conflicts with copyright stuff in YouTube. Belly dance trap. If you're an editor and you've got a couple of 20-somethings that have taken a wrong turn and they go to a, walk into a club and you need belly dance music um, for that club, because it's, you know, there's actually a club in, in um, Philadelphia called the Middle East, which really has nothing to do with belly dancing. But let's say that our two lost people in this town or neighborhood, uh, and, and they walk into a place called the Middle East, you might hear, expect to hear belly dance playing, right? So there you go. Um, there's a, a restaurant that serves... Um, Middle Eastern food in Hollywood. I don't even know if it's still there, but it's called Dharma Greb or Dharma Greb. Um, and they've got belly dancers all over the restaurant and you sit on the floor and eat at a low table and you scoop up whatever it is and put it in little pieces of flatbread at your table with your hands. Certainly couldn't eat there during COVID, but uh, that would be a place that would have belly dance trap playing as source music out of the speakers in the restaurant. So there you go. If you're an editor and that's what you're looking for, Belly Dance Trap, that's the first one you're going to play. And if it's the music is right, the right tempo, the right emotion, the right everything, that's going to end up in the scene. Somebody else might have a thing called, you know, Rosalie's, Rosalie's theme. What the hell does that mean? Who's Rosalie? What's the theme? I don't know. It could be equally as good, equally on target. Belly Dance Trap is going to get spotted first and used before Rosalie. Um, Kafir, that sounds like a Middle Eastern cue. Um, praise him, that sounds like a religious, a gospel thing. Um, epidemic, that's probably going to be, bum, 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 you know, some sort of arpeggiated synthesizer thing uh, when somebody's going to be looking through a microscope at the dreaded COVID 19 um, CrossFit. You know what that's going to sound like? Um, lost in thought. 
oh my gosh, you know, there's our uh, person that's come from somewhere. They have a quiet moment. They go into their room. They're sitting there and they're having an introspective moment, lost in thought. There you go. Um, silly rabbit. <laughs> I could see just by looking at the waveform that one, um, what it's going to be. It's very percussive. Um, and I don't necessarily mean with percussion, but the, the, the notes are very, uh, the waveform's very choppy. So it's going to be silly um, and comedic. Excuse me. Um, stomp music. Certainly know what that's going to sound like. Pandemic. Um, did I have a pandemic? Oh, I had epidemic. And now he's got pandemic. Smart. Um, shopping spree. I can't really hear what that sounds like, but it's going to have a lot of activity and action to it. And it's probably going to be emotionally uplifting and fun. Um, battle for honor. Oh yeah. You know what that's going to sound like. Um, Mandela, kind of a brilliant title. That's going to sound regal and important and inspiring, right? Um, dark dreams. You know what that's going to sound like. Contagious, another, uh, COVID-19 track. Um, High Roller, that's going to be music that you would hear in a scene that takes place in a casino, right? Blues Clues, duh. In the Bushes, I can tell you without even listening to it that that's going to be dramedy music. Absolutely. Um, dark Atmosphere. Um GOAT, G-O-A-T, in all caps with periods. That's going to be um, music for like football highlights, the greatest of all time. Aftermath, that's going to be after, you know, a hurricane or some other disaster happens. Um, Jazzy D, Mecca, that's going to be Middle Eastern, heated conversation, um, coroner. That, that coroner, that's two thirds of the way through the pandemic show as they're taking people away from the old folks home, sadly, under a sheet. Um, viral revelation, uh, Wakanda, um, test trial, uh, lab rat, um, lab test, urgent report. Um, clearly, those were all created probably in response to the many uh, pandemic related listings that we were running in April, May, and June. Um, fun in the sun. You know what that's going to sound like. Um, trial and error. Um, that's probably going to be pandemic related. Escalation. And you know what? I'm looking at the waveform on escalation. And guess what? It looks like it's getting bigger and bigger. Um, lab mice. Body count. Remorse, crime lover, plea deal, troublemaker, slow dance, fist fight, all pro, certainly um, going to be for like sports highlights, power play, um, not entirely sure that could be, you know, a uh, uh, an emotional power play, it could be a, a sports thing. I'm not sure on that one. Um, throwing Shade. I don't know what that one's going to sound like necessarily, but it's a great title. Trap Country. Action News. Crime Wave. Uh, escape Room. Prognosis. Anyway, you get the idea. I'm not going to sit here and read all 200 of them, but um, I think that Derek Handy is just, yes, a megaform shaped waveform. Absolutely. Uh, Derek Handy is the master of titles. Um, I'm sure that I complimented him on that when I interviewed him for Passenger Profile. So, I mean, yeah, go check that out after the show. Go check out uh, Derek's page and uh, you'll see a bunch of great titles. 
and spend an hour. You know what? Give yourself an hour of free education. Listen to the quality of his work. Listen to the, or look at the title, play the cue. And, and think about everything that I've talked about in this show today, about how things grow, edit points, adding or introducing instrumentation, um, buttoned and stinger endings. A button ending is, is, by the way, is just when it goes back to the tonic and boom, ends on a period. To me, a stinger ending is the same thing, it goes back to the tonic in most cases and ends with an exclamation point. So a lot of times in taxi listings, you'll see button slash stinger ending, meaning you could treat it either way, depending on, on the genre or on your piece. Um, they're very closely related, but again, this is my terminology. I mean, stinger and button were not words that were invented by me or, or invented in the context of how they're used in the industry. But the differentiation point is something that I believe I came up with, which is a button is a period and a stinger is an exclamation point. Um, I covered all that stuff. Okay. How perfect do my tracks need to be? Um, perfection is oftentimes the enemy. Um, again, they're not looking for the most brilliant composer. They're looking for a composer that has created a piece of music that is usable for their purpose right now. Um, if your composition is so perfect and so wonderful, it's liable to steal the show. And that's the last thing they want in most cases. And if you're looking about, uh, if you're thinking about, well, I'm gonna create the piece that's the exception. I want my music to stand out. Okay, that might happen once every five years versus creating a piece that is very usable in many applications and has a great title that points people to it. That might get used five times in a year instead of once every five years. Which one do you want to compose? Um, while we're on the subject of what gets used and what doesn't, there's a thing called the Pareto Principle. Um, it's called, also called the 80-20 rule. Uh, it means uh, in, the, in the world of sales, 80% of your sales are gonna come from 20% of your prospects. Uh, it's a statistical thing that just proves itself true over and over and over again. And I've gotta say, in the myriad conversations I've had with hundreds, if not thousands of taxi members over the 28, almost 29 years I've been running this company, Virtually every one of them would tell you that the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, is absolutely true for them. That 80% of their income comes from 20% of their cues. So you might think, well, gee, why don't we just look at what the 20% of their cues are that make the most money and forget creating the other 80%. Let's just create the 20%. Nobody's been able to figure that out. Um, they just can't because why your cues get used, uh, uh, there's so many variations or variables that create the circumstance in which a cue gets used. It, it might be in, in library production. <clears throat> Let's say you've created a piece that you've signed non-exclusively to three production music libraries. And let's say that it's a sneaky, mischievous uh, dramedy piece. Library A mostly works on one-hour TV dramas. That's most of their client base. Um, and they typically use more songs than instrumentals. Library B um, has a lot of like the stuff that would get used in independent films, um, emotional singer-songwriter stuff, um, small string quartets, um, light emotional solo piano stuff. There's a, a range of stuff that kind of typically shows up in a lot of indie films. Of course, there are many types of indie films, but those are just some that are popping into my head right now. Now, Library C. Library C has about six different clients that are all working on reality TV shows. Where is your sneaky, mischievous, dramedy piece gonna get the most action? In Library A? Library B or Library C, duh. So 
that's part of the formula. That's part of the secret sauce right there is take a look at the shows that the library that you've been offered a deal with. Um, do they do a lot of reality TV? Do they do a lot of stuff with the NBA wives? Well, okay, then they're probably going to use a lot of urban dramedy. That's hip hop flavored dramedy cues. So there you go. Um, all these puzzle pieces are staring you in the face. You just have to take a moment to put them together. And all this tells me to tell you that you could be wasting your time if you're sitting down just going, what kind of instrumental piece shall I create today? Now, I'm not saying that you should never just, you know, create from the heart or create when the muse pays a visit. But there is a business side to the business of music or the music business. You can do both. They are not um, exclusionary. Just because you are thinking like a business person and creating music that has high usability factor does not mean that you can't write romantic ballads with lyrics also. Um, I'm trying to help you make money with your music. So especially for new Taxi members who have never heard me talk about this before, if you join Taxi and you recorded an album and pressed up 500 CDs with disc makers three years ago, and you've still got 397 of them sitting in the box boxes in your garage or your basement, I'm going to join Taxi and see if they can get this stuff in a movie because, wow, my stuff would work really well in movies. It might but the chances are something you created in the past won't fit the exact needs of somebody who needs something tomorrow. Are they going to rewrite a scene to accommodate your music that you wrote from the heart? No. Are, are they going to re-edit the show because they love this song that you wrote that was really sweet and tender? No, they're not. Um, so I do recommend that you learn how to create music in response to the taxi listings. But before you get your panties in a bunch about that, I'm not saying that you can't do what you normally do. You can still write from the heart. You can still wait for the muse to show up. You can do the sappy love song thing. You can. There's nothing that says you can't do that and do this. This is the thing that puts money in the bank, food on the table, and after you do it for a while, it's going to start to add up and it gains momentum. It's like a snowball rolling down a hill. And once it gains that momentum, you start to make some income. Who knows? You might be able, like some of our members, like, I don't know, Chuck Henry, Matt Vanderbo, um, Matt Hurt. There are um, many, many taxi members that have been able to, when I say many, many, I'm talking, you know, a couple of dozen that I'm aware of over the years. But there are taxi members that at a point are making enough money from doing music and mostly these instrumental cues that I'm talking about today that they've been able to leave their day job and do what they love to do most, which is create music. Does that preclude them from doing love songs? No. Can they do both? Absolutely. I just want to see you use your skills and do something you love and put food on the table for your family doing it. It's absolutely doable. It's going to take some time and it's going to take some work, but it's absolutely doable. We know that because we've seen plenty of taxi members do it. So how perfect your tracks need to be? Not that perfect. Can you use a, a DX7 for your string sounds? No. Can you use a $1,000 string library to create your strings? Uh, it probably won't cut the muster even if you do that unless you know how to do the expressions and articulations. You know, if you've got a 30-foot bow doing ah, versus ah, ah, the $1,000 library doesn't mean anything. So perfection is beating a dead horse and I've got an expression that I always say, which is just because you can doesn't mean you should. The other expression, which I certainly didn't invent, but I use all the time, which is simpler is often better. That's, that's like a 95% rule. The simpler it is, probably the more money it's going to make. That I know 
from our taxi members I've asked about the Pareto principle. Well, which 20% of your stuff makes 80% of your income? And, and they almost always say, you know, the funny thing is I created this big orchestral piece, but as one of my alt mixes, I did just a piano cello version of it. That's the one that gets used all the time. I can tell you with, with certainty actually that the simpler stuff will get used more often. So if you're gonna stay up till four o'clock in the morning adding a bunch of parts to show everybody what a compositional genius you are, don't. Get some sleep. Um, let's see, I covered that already. Covered that already. How many cues do I need to start making significant income? More than a handful. The, the rule of thumb at Taxi with our most successful and most experienced members is write, submit, forget, and repeat. Write, submit, forget, and repeat. Don't get so precious that when one of your pieces gets forwarded to a library that you check your email every hour to see if they're going to respond. It's going to take them anywhere between a week and a year to get back to you. I know that's torture. Just keep moving forward because the is a dear friend of mine who is arguably the godfather of the production music library business uh, once said to me, it's a penny business. You need to create a lot of music to earn a lot of pennies, but it adds up over time. And it does. That's how we have taxi members that are making six figure incomes. Some of them multiple six figure incomes, but they may get placements in a reality show that generate a dollar 62 or $12.41, or maybe $97. It's all over the board, depending on what time of day, how long the queue is in there. Um, is it on a small cable net? Is it on a big, you know, huge cable net that's um, all over the world? Um, all these things go into the magical formula that dictates how much money you will make. Don't worry about any one piece of music. Don't worry about any one placement. Don't worry about any one library. Just keep cranking it out because the more you do it, the better you get, the better your pieces will get, the more you will understand everything that I've spoken about today and the more successful you will become over time. If I had to spit out a rule of thumb, typically for those who work hard at it and take it seriously, it usually takes two to three years to start to gain some traction. Two to three years. You just have to have blind faith and go, okay, I'm not getting forwarded much, and when I do get forwarded, I don't hear from libraries, and you will be frustrated, you will be pissed off at taxi, you will just want to throw in the towel and go, the hell, why did I believe that guy? But for those who don't walk away in that little dark moment, those who stick it out are the ones who inevitably in year three go, oh, look at that, I made 7,200 bucks this year. And then in year number four, they made 10,000. In year number five, they made 12,300. By the time they get up to year seven or eight, they're making 40, 50, 60, 70 grand a year. Again, it all depends on how much you work and what your output is and are you constantly getting better. But I would say that it takes eight to 10 years to cross that six figure line. Um, we've had members that have done it in five or six years. Um, again, it all goes back to your work ethic. Also, you know, what types of cues, what genres? I mean, if you're doing, um, you know, I don't know, death metal, you're not going to have as many placements as somebody that does hip hop. There's just less need for it. Um, how many cues per week should I be able to create? In the beginning, if you can get one done a week, that's good. If you can eventually get it to the point where you're doing one a day, awesome. And if you're doing like light acoustic guitar stuff that's only got one or two or three instruments or maybe solo piano tracks, you might be able to do two or three cues in a day. Um, how good do my recordings and productions need to be? Um, get to know the other taxi members that are on the taxi forum at forumswithans.taxi.com and go to the forward section. It's the very top thing when you go to forums.taxi.com and listen to the music of theirs that was forwarded. 
then you can go to the success story area right below that and listen to the music that got signed or ended up in TV shows. Um, when you listen to Derek Candy stuff after to this evening's show, you'll, you'll get a pretty good indication. But don't rely on just one impression from just one member. Check out many members. Absorb everything you can. Um, where can I learn more about creating instrumental cues? I'm going to say it again. If you don't spend 30 bucks on this book, bad move. You need it. And here's another book that's a must-have, Demystifying the Cue by Dean Crepain, another one of our successful members. I don't know how much Dean makes, but I would guesstimate that he's probably around 100K a year. I'm just guessing. He's never confided in me with that number, but I know how long he's been doing it and how many placements he gets. He's probably a six-figure member. He wrote this book, which is amazing, Demystifying the Cue, and then he wrote a sequel to it, which is also amazing. Both of these are must-haves, Demystifying the Genre, where he actually tells you how cues, how certain cues were put together. He gives you links to where you can listen to them as you're reading and learning about how the track was built, what the instrumentation was, the arrangement, all that stuff. So those three books, Demystifying the Cue, Demystifying the Genre, Writing Production Music for TV by Steve Barden, the other two by Dean Crepain, the three of them should cost you, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 dollars, something like that. Even if you're going through financial tough times, somebody in the family could buy you these three books. It will be the greatest holiday gift that you will have gotten in a very, very, very long time. They will change your life. Um, so that's it. Look at that. I'm only one minute over. Um, don't forget to subscribe. If you haven't, give us a thumbs up. We appreciate that. Um, and I will see you tomorrow for an exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. With that, I bid you a fond farewell. Thank you for paying attention. Great to see all you guys in the chat room, although I barely paid any attention to you today because I really had to get through all that stuff. So thanks, guys. Uh, I will see you tomorrow, 4 o'clock, right back here for the Quarantini Happy Hour. I bid you a fond farewell. <laughs> Keith LeBrant, ladies and gentlemen.